This is Ron Gattardi, Volunteer Director of the Oral History Program aboard the battleship New Jersey. Today is June the 24th, 2017, and we're here on the battleship New Jersey to talk with Dave Goodwin, who was a crew member on the battleship New Jersey during the 1980s commissioning, the fourth and last commissioning of the battleship New Jersey. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Ron. It's good to have you here on the ship. You've been here a few times? I have. And I'm sure you find it interesting every time. Did you sign our wall downstairs? Down, uh, yeah. down yes, down? yes I did. Okay, great. Dave, why don't you start, uh, we'll just have a little conversation here. Just uh, tell us uh, how you got into the Navy and why. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just, had, my dad was in the Navy. Excuse me, just a second. Would you take your hat off please, Dave? just so we don't have a shadow on your face. You can put it on that couch behind you. Okay, great. Um, first, let me ask you a question. How old are you now? I'm 52 now. And how old were you when you entered the Navy? I was 18. 18. And now proceed with your story about how you got in the Navy, please. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, so uh, I had always, always had an interest in it, and I had always had an interest in battleships. So. Uh, I joined the Navy actually at 16 on the delayed entry program and uh, at that time I, I had no idea that this ship was even being refurbished and uh, I chose to be an operations specialist. I signed up for five years and I, I was fortunate enough that I did well enough in my A school that I got one of two orders for this ship. Only two? There really? was only two were available at that time. Wow, that's pretty good. What did your dad do in the Navy? Uh, my dad was a boiler technician on the first supercarrier, the USS Forrestal. Forrestal, that was overhauled here at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Yes, it was. And it was the first ship of its class, and it's uh, almost all of the ships in its class were overhauled here at the Navy Yard under the SLEP program in the 1970s, I think it was. That must have been after the uh, ship was overhauled. Okay, um, all right, so you went to uh, A school to be an op operations specialist and uh, you got the, uh, the rating when you got out of school and then you were assigned right away to the New Jersey, is that right? Correct. I, uh, I was able to pick my orders. Uh, I, I graduated high enough in my class. I got my, the order pick that I wanted, which was one of the only two uh, availabilities for the ship at that time and uh, I left my home in New Jersey to travel to California and join the New Jersey. We'll be fine. Okay and when you saw it the first time tell us your reaction. Actually the the first time I saw it was in San Diego it was down there on a port of call and uh, I actually didn't think it was that big at first glance uh, possibly because she sat so low in the water when, when fully fueled. But uh, I, once I got on board and started seeing the, the compartments and deck space, then I actually knew how large this ship was. Okay, and you saw it in San Diego before you were assigned to it? Well, I was, uh, the ship at that time was assigned to home port in uh, Long Beach, California. But she was in San Diego at the time for a port call visit. Uh, my parents have relatives that live in Escondido. I stayed the weekend with them and they brought me to the ship. And then I, I joined the ship there and went back to Long Beach. Okay. All right. So tell us about, uh, where did you go to boot camp? I went to uh, Great, Great Lakes, Illinois in the fall. And I was fortunate enough that I left in the second week of December during the first snowfall. Okay, that's a good time to leave Great Lakes. I understand it could be pretty cold there. No yeah, it time. seemed to be perfect timing for me. Yeah, that's great. Anything memorable about your boot camp? Uh, Any stories you want to tell us? Sea stories? You know, I boot camp, um, it was it it was a t tough experience for a person when you join the Navy or any military service at 17 or 18 having never really been away from home and 
every moment of every day is managed by your company commanders who don't seem to be the friendliest individuals you have ever met. But uh, it was a good experience. It was uh, 11 or 12 weeks that seemed that like it would never end. But it was a positive thing because there's things that I do today that I learned in boot camp. Such and, as? Uh, well, the silliest things of how to fold your, your underwear and put them in, in a certain order. It taught you attention to detail, and that's what I've carried with me from that su that's such a silly task. To this day, I pay attention to detail in everything I do. That's great. And you learn how to make a bed, too, I guess. Well, you, yeah, you do that. You, you There's many things you learn. Okay, now you're aboard the battleship New Jersey, and... Uh, uh, what's going on? Uh, is it shipping out right away as soon as you were aboard? Uh, at that point in time, we were doing a lot of workups. Uh, we were operating in SoCal, Southern California operating area. We would go out for three, five days, seven days, two weeks, just testing out systems because the ship had just been recommissioned that past, I believe, December. I, I got on board in the spring of 83. Okay. So it was testing the engines, the steering mechanism, testing the missiles. The you missiles know. were all new then aboard the Tomahawk was new technology. New Jersey. Clean right. Call the quarterback. Seven two zero three. This was uh, one of the first combat vessels that was carrying Tomahawk at that time. Uh, we were also carrying the Harpoon anti surface missile. So uh testing the guns out, you know, testing the crew. The crew hadn't been together that long, so uh, we all had to prove ourselves along with the systems. Where did you work? In the Combat Engagement Center? Uh, yes, I worked in the Combat Engagement Center and the Combat Information Center. Okay, and which are two different places? Two different places, and yes. the Combat Engagement Center is up a few de uh, levels from here? Yes. And the CIC uh, is down a few decks, is that right? Right, CIC, uh, if I remember correctly, is four decks below the main deck. Yeah, it's near plot, main plot, I believe? Yes, it is. Okay. All right, and uh, so w were you involved with the missiles? I was later on. Um, <laughs> When I checked on board, like any new sailor, uh, you, you have everything to learn. Whatever you learned in boot camp, whatever you learned in A school, that's behind you. Now you have to learn everything from fresh. You're on the ship, now you're going to do it the ship's way. So I did a lot of mundane tasks like cleaning compartments and polishing brass and polishing the decks. Uh, I did my 90-day uh, mess duty, and interspersed with that, I also was learning my rating from my seniors. Anything and everything they would, they would teach me, I would learn. And that's where your journey begins. Great. And uh, how long did this go on before she shipped out to some other port? I, or other part of the kind of the world. I joined New Jersey in the spring of '83, and uh, I don't remember the exact month, but within within months, we were on a shakedown cruise. We were we were going to go on a uh, two to three month shakedown cruise in the Pacific. Show the flag, show the ship, show what America has done. This is one. This is the first operational battleship the world had seen in years. And uh, again, we were testing the systems and testing the crew. And uh, it what, was... What part of the Pacific were you in? Do you know? Uh, we started with uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. You know, we went to... Uh, first time to Hawaii for you? Absolutely. Did you like it? First time in the Pacific. I loved it. I loved it. It's Get some liberty while you were there? Yes. Good. Yes, what an adventure, and to see the blue seas of the Pacific is just amazing. You know, it's just such a calm ocean. It, it, it's a sight to behold. 
Where else besides the? I don't. Uh, I don't exactly program. remember a lot of the protocols. I, I, I believe we. Did you go to the Philippines. I believe we hit the Philippines. Uh, Japan, maybe. No, we. Uh, the shakedown cruise was cut short. Uh, we ended up being detached and sent to uh, Central America to patrol off the coast of Nicaragua. So uh, we had several port of calls uh, that were canceled. On the west side of uh, Central America? Yes. Okay, and then, then what? Well, we, uh, we patrolled there, and then shortly before detaching and heading home, uh, we received orders to proceed to the Panama Canal Zone and prepare to transit the canal. Okay, well, that was a surprise, I guess. That was that was a big surprise. Okay, and and home port was uh, Long Beach. Yeah, home port home port was Long Beach, California. Okay. All right. So, uh, what was it like going through the Panama Canal? Uh, hot. Uh, to this day, I can say uh, Panama is the hottest place on the planet, at least from my experience. But uh, to transit the canal and to see what this country created in building that canal was just amazing. And this ship was designed so perfectly that we fit through the locks of the canal with very little room to spare. Yeah, I think it was less than a foot on each side or something like that. And I, I was told that they had to train fire hoses on the side of the ship to keep the, the friction. That is correct. You saw they, that. Mm -hmm. they removed the scuppers on the sides of the ship, and as we transited the canal, they would uh, spray water along the sides of the ship. So we did scrape paint going through. Okay, so you go through the, uh, the canal, and then what? Uh, we proceeded to uh, Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico. And that was to uh, get stores and uh, refuel. And our orders were to proceed at uh, high speed transit and arrive in uh, the Mediterranean to operate off the coast of Beirut, Lebanon. And um, that was to uh, protect the Marines. <clears throat> Tell us what happened then. Um, for the most part, um, things were quiet. You know, um, I imagine people think that um, when you arrive in an operating area that would be considered maybe a war zone, that um, everything's exciting. And uh, for the most part, it's not. There's a lot of boredom. Uh, a lot of quiet at night. Uh, when we would stand bridge watch, you would see a lot of star shells, tracer fire. Um, you wouldn't hear so much because we were in a fire support area that was offshore, so you, you really didn't hear too much. They weren't firing on your Norman, New Jersey. No. The um, of white Dodge. You must move your car immediately. To my knowledge, uh, I don't. Dodge. I can't say that we were ever directly fired upon. Um, I know for certain that we had fire control radars locked on to us from, from the beach. That I do know for certain. But, um, you know, our mission was to protect the Marines, and they were there to, uh, you know, prevent a, a conflict from growing into something much greater. So we were on a, we were on a peacekeeping mission. We weren't there to, uh, for no, no gain. Okay, and the Marine barracks bombing uh, occurred while you were there. That w that was probably the uh, my worst. That absolutely was the worst day I I had in the Navy. Worst day on this ship. Uh, I was on duty at the time. I was in CEC. I was uh, guarding a tactical circuit, and uh, that morning the lieutenant, the uh, intel officer, that was. Uh, assigned to the ship came in and told the uh, TAO, the tactical actions officer, that there had been a bombing. And uh, we didn't know what that meant at the time. But uh, shortly thereafter we went to general quarters and moved in closer 
to provide naval gunfire support or whatever was required of us. And uh, there, there wasn't anything militarily we could have done to respond except to lend assistance and to maintain the presence that no one was going to attack the Marines further. It was, it was a very quiet day on board. And one of your crewmates was in that Marine barracks at the time. Yes. Yes, that was ETC Gorchinsky, who had uh, volunteered to go ashore to fix a piece of gear. And uh, he was in the barracks at the time. Uh, so how soon did you get uh, some sense of the extent of the casualties there? Was it a day or two later? Or no, it was uh, a few hours or not. It, it was very quickly. We knew the uh, there was a lot of smoke. The building was down. Um, like I said, we proceeded in close to provide support, uh, gunfire support if necessary. Um, the ship. Uh, sent Marines ashore, they sent medical help ashore, um, they, bring, they brought uh, stretchers and litters, you know, whatever they could send, they sent, and uh, it was very quiet on the ship, you know, for a ship of 1,500. <clears throat> to go on the, the mess decks, where there's um, hundreds of sailors and uh, it's absolute silence. It, it was a bad day. Did they bring any casualties aboard the ship? Uh, no, they did not. Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. And. Um, how soon after that did uh, you fire the guns in anger? Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but uh, I know in uh, December of uh, 83, we fired uh, about a dozen rounds of 16-inch main battery. Tell us what that was like. And where were you at the time? In the combat uh, engagement at the, center? At the time, I was in the combat engagement center. I was on watch. I was the surface scope operator, and uh, we were a multinational force, so there was British, French, and Italian ships operating. So the surface scope operator had to know where all vessels within your radar range are located. When we fired, the whole port emptied out. So maintaining a picture of what was going on for me was impossible because this was something practically no one had seen uh, a battleship arriving offshore and firing its main battery. So, and, and what you said the, the port emptied out, the ships left the port? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. Mostly small. They, they wanted to get out of the line of fire, I guess. Mostly small craft. We were firing up into the mountains, but it was just. It's such a unbelievable sight to see this massive ship offshore firing its main battery and you see this you know this flame and smoke and you hear this rush of these shells going overhead uh, it got people's attention and uh, it let the Marines know that we were going to protect them. Definitely brought up their morale. Great. Did uh, when you were in this uh, CEC, uh, did, uh, could you feel the guns fire, and what what did that feel like? Uh, you could you could feel the guns firing. Uh, you felt that concussion. You heard that rumble from uh, the projectiles leaving the gun barrels. You know, so you you knew. You knew what was going on. 
You know, even so, even inside the skin of the ship, you knew. And did you say how many f uh, volleys you fired? Uh, I I believe we fired about a dozen rounds. I you know this it's been a long time, so my memory is you know a little skewed, but. I know I do have everything written down and documented in my home, but it was about a, about a dozen rounds. Did you were you ever on deck for the firing of the 16-inch uh, guns? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was w when we operated in the SoCal operator area, and when we would do uh, uh, naval gunfire testing, uh, I would go outside the skin of the ship to observe. You know, usually I'd be considerable distance away, but. Uh, there was one occasion where I was sent up on bridge watch, and I did not know we were doing a gun X. And uh, the glass on the bridge is about an inch thick, and it was all rolled down. So we were going to be firing turret one or two. So that was quite an experience to be that close to the 16s firing that... Uh, to, uh, to to just experience the sight and sound of that was just unbelievable. And feel the pressure wave? You, you, feel? you felt the pressure, you smelt the cordite, you felt the heat of the blast. You couldn't, you can't get any closer than being on the bridge. Hmm. So, and I'm not ashamed to say that I did duck down at times because uh, it didn't matter if you had earplugs in it or if you had earplugs and headphones on. It just did not matter. They are loud, especially at that distance. Yeah, the five-inch guns are pretty loud too, aren't they? Yeah, the five-inch thirty-eights are actually louder than the the sixteen-inch fifties because they're a sharp crack. Right. That's what I've been told by a, a number of people I've, been, I've interviewed. Uh, we haven't fired the sixteen-inch guns since we've been here, but uh, the five-inch we have. That is a sharp retort, I'll tell yes. you that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the ship felt pretty good about firing the guns in anger uh, off of Beirut, I assume? Well, I, I, I'm not going to say we felt good about firing the guns in anger. We felt good about doing our job. And our job was to uh, protect the Marines. Our job was to stop a localized conflict be from becoming something greater, something worse. But our, our job was to protect those Marines and we felt good about that. Did you ever hear any reports of the damage done by that volley? Um, at the time I was a very junior operations specialist so I would really not be privileged to that information. Um, so uh, after action reports wasn't something that I would see, you know, and I'm sure that's still highly classified to this day. I know just even without hitting anything, firing a 16-inch projectile, having a, a armed aggressor hear that, know what's coming, and having it land anywhere close is going to have them think twice about what their intentions are. Okay, then um, what happened after that? I, some some people got uh, got to go home. Is that uh, is that true? Well, um, like I said before, we started out on a very short uh, shakedown cruise. We ended up transiting the Panama Canal, crossing the Atlantic. Now we're on a peacekeeping mission. We're out off the coast of Beirut, Lebanon. We don't know how long we're going to be there. There is no other ship in our class to relieve us. The Iowa isn't ready. So they decided that, that what they would do it would seek out volunteers from the reserves that would take their place of some of us so we could go home. And what they did was they ran a lottery system. And if you your name was pulled, you won the lottery, you could go home for a two-week furlough to get away. How long, how long had it been since you were home at that time? At that time, uh, this this is in the um, this is probably December, January of '84. Um, 
So it's going on a year since I had been home at that time. And uh, so we had reservists taking our places. If you if you won on the lottery system, you could go home. Um, Did you? Well, I won on the last drawing of the lottery. At that point, I had made it so far, I was determined I was doing the whole deployment. I turned it down. So somebody else could go. Well, somebody else probably went, but there were a few of us, at least in my department, that we said, you know what, we made it this far. Um, we didn't have wives, we didn't have children, you know, we were single guys. Um, we said, we're going to do this whole thing. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say I'm considered a survivor. And there was only, out of a crew of 1,500, I, I believe there was only a 240 possibly that were survivors, that we did the whole thing. We did 331 days, which may be still the longest peacetime deployment. So how much later, than, uh, how much after that did uh, you head for home, did the ship head for home? Well, we fired again in February of 84. Uh, there was a day where we fired uh, several hundred 16-inch projectiles. And then uh, we, the uh, carriers would fly TARPS missions. They would do tactical reson reconnaissance missions. And uh, what led up to that firing that day, I, I can't recall at this time. A lot of time has passed by. But we fired 16-inch main battery most of the day. Several more months passed by, and uh, the day finally came that we got orders to outchop, and that was just amazing that we finally were going to go home. Um, I was, you know, it's, it seem, may seem or sound silly, but I was at a point where I thought, here, I'm going to spend my whole Navy enlistment right here because there was no replacement for us and we had no idea how long we were going to be there. But So the day finally came in the spring of 84, late spring, and we headed home. And that was just a, a, an amazing thing. And to, to actually arrive back in Long Beach, even though I did not have children or a spouse to meet me, seeing thousands of civilians waiting. That that was incredible. You know, that's that's something that everybody should experience some kind of greeting like that. So did you uh, go all the way home uh, to, uh, when you got there? Uh, did you get leave to, to uh, go home? I, I did. I did. You know, not right away, but I did. You know, I went home for a couple weeks to visit my family. And then back to the ship again. Yeah, back to the ship. And so you're going, you go home, and then you go home again. Because the ship is your home. Right. Okay, so what happened then when you came back to the ship? Um, you, you didn't get married while you were at home, did you? No, no. When I came back to the ship, they sent me to uh, San Diego. Uh, myself and another, uh, one of my shipmates, we attended... Uh, Watch Center Supervisor School down in San Diego. And then uh, you get back into that normal port routine, you know, you know, boring shipboard life. Ship, ships need a lot of maintenance. Uh, we do a lot of training. You go to schools. And then uh, even though the ship's been at sea for so long, you go back to sea. You go about, you back out and you train. All right, so where did you go then after that? Well, the, the ship would operate in the SoCal operator area again. We'd go out to San Clemente Island, test the guns out. You know, this, you, uh, you practice steaming in company with other vessels. You, you practice underway replenishment, you know. We, uh, we had the ability, we carried two million gallons of fuel, so we had the ability uh, that we could refuel our escorts. You know, we were essentially, we were a combat vessel, but we could also operate as a tanker. So we, we had some unique abilities. So these are things you practice. You, you, your, air, your air controllers, 
that worked out of CEC. They would practice controlling fixed wing aircraft and uh, uh, helicopters. Yeah, there's just a lot of things that you would go to see to practice. Navigation, you know, emergency drills. Just something that you just continually do. Okay, and uh, any, uh, did you stay in the Pacific until your, uh, your time aboard ended? Yeah, we, uh, we stayed in the Pacific. We did uh, a 45 day rim pack, which was just a short cruise in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, in uh, 1986, I did a Westpac deployment which was a standard six-month deployment. We, uh, we actually went up into the Sea of Okosk, went up uh, alongside in, into uh, Russian waters. So uh, that was very interesting. Everything we did was interesting. It, it was just, for me, it was such a positive experience being on this ship. I had always been interested in the Navy and the military, always been interested in battleships. I always wondered as a kid, why don't they modernize these things and then they did and I I was a part of it you know and I, and I served with such good people that it, it just was uh, all together is just an amazing experience what ports did you hit did you hit any Japanese ports while on these uh, yeah we um, you know it, we hit Hawaii we hit Korea we hit uh, Singapore Thailand Hong Kong the Philippines, uh, Sasebo, Japan. Um, I never did get to Australia. Um, something I wish I had done, but just never got there. But I got to see so much of the world uh, during our time in Beirut. I got the chance to, extremely briefly, but I got to Egypt. I visited Israel, which I really enjoyed very much to be in Israel. Um, Italy, France, so I, I got to see a lot, you know, that's one thing, when it, you join the Navy, you join to see the world, that's the truth, you do. So you, you understand how big this world is. What were your favorite ports? Um, I can't, I can't say that, I, I don't know that I had any favorites, I mean, uh, like I said, Balboa, Panama was the hottest place on the planet I'd ever experienced. Um, I enjoyed the people of Israel. Um, the Philippines, every sailor will tell you that's a good time. You know, that's, you just have a good time in the Philippines. Singapore and Thailand, gorgeous. Um, Philippines, when it's time to rain, it rains. And it shuts off as quick as it starts. But another, again, that's, the Philippines are a beautiful place. They're wonderful people. You know, I, I enjoyed every port I went to. There, was, there wasn't one I disliked. The, just the fact that I was going all over the planet, um, doing, you know, just seeing places that I would never see on my own. Just an amazing thing. And then I also saw places in the United States I had I'd never been to. I, I got to Seattle transit through the Straits traveling to Seattle. Another beautiful thing. You know, I was fortunate enough to be stationed in California. I attended my basic schooling in Virginia. So I, I, I got to see a lot. You know, something I'll never regret. Okay. Um, then uh, you got out in 87. Did you serve on any other ships or any shore duty? Uh, I got out and Briefly, uh, I, I, I joined the reserves. That didn't work out. How did your, your time aboard the New Jersey end? How did, how did that come about? Well, my, uh, I was on a five-year enlistment. Um, I had decided that I did not want to re-enlist because for me, I knew if I was to re-enlist once, it was going to be for a career. And I just, I missed my family. I, being a... Uh, being away from my family the first time, I was gone a year and a half. And when I, when I saw my, my parents, I, I noticed they had physically aged so much in, in my eyes. You know, 
where, where we don't notice ourselves age. If you leave, you see it. And uh, I guess I just missed home, maybe. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed being an operations specialist, especially on this ship. And to this day, I'll, I'll readily admit it's the best job I've ever had. But uh, my enlistment came, it came due, and I, and, I, and I told them what I wanted, and they were willing to give me what I wanted. They were willing to give me a shore duty in Australia, and uh, I just had to say, you know what, I, I think I want to go home and, and see if I can make a go of life as a civilian. But I, I did miss the Navy, and I tried the reserves, and... Uh, I didn't stay in the reserves. I did serve on a fast frigate. So, when you were in the reserves, yes, I did. And that was during summer. Uh, yeah, that was during mm -hmm. your. You know, I was attached to a fast frigate. I was attached to the Boeing. And uh, Boeing. Yep. How do you, you spell that? B O W E N. Thank you. Um, so I did go. To, I did go to sea on a fast frigate, and that was a totally different experience. What was the hull code of the Boeing? Do you remember? I'm going to say FF-1058, possibly. Okay. She was uh, classified an FFT at the time. But um, I didn't stay in the reserves. Now, you know, I made that young man decision where you decide that, you know, this isn't for me. I'm going to, you know, stick with my primary job. I'm going to work my overtime and, uh, you how, know. How long were you in the reserves? I was probably in the reserves a year and a half. You know, but uh, I do regret leaving the reserves because uh, to this day I, I still miss the military and having a son in the military, I, I love going on a base, I love being around people in the military, I got nothing but respect for them, you know, I, you, you kind of, I, I miss it, I miss being a part of something bigger. And your son is in the Army now? Yes, he is. Where is he deployed, do you know? Uh, my son just left the 10th Mountain Division, and he is with the 2nd Combat Aviation Brigade, 2nd Division, uh, South Korea. He's at Camp Humphreys. And how close is that to the de demilitarized zone? I believe he's within 50 miles. Okay. Well, we admire his service, too. Yeah. Any other stories you want to tell us about your time in the, in the Navy? Any uh, sea stories? I don't know that there's any sea stories. I can tell you that this ship, it, it, it's just amazing that something that weighs 58,000 tons fully loaded, she's just shy of 900 feet long, she floats, and she could travel at almost 40 miles an hour. That is just amazing. It was it was always a pleasure going to sea on this ship, especially when she transited at high speed. She rode she rode like a Cadillac. That's that's the only way I could uh, to describe it. She rode beautifully. It was a, it was a pleasure being out to sea. I really I did enjoy it very much. You know, uh, there's not much to do when you're at sea. Especially as an operations specialist, you spend a lot of time on duty. So, uh, you know, we would jog on the fantail in the forecastle, get some exercise. We uh, sunbathed on Steel Beach, which was the uh, Tomahawk missile decks. You had to have a pad to put down because steel in the Pacific uh -huh. gets a little hot, so you're not walking barefoot. Um, you know, you found things to do. The ship, and they, and they, the ship was good because they did things for you. Um, holidays, we always had a, a, a great spread on the mess decks. Meals were, you weren't wanting for anything. Occasionally, you'd have a cookout on the fantail. They'd have uh, what they'd call smokers, boxing matches. Um... Did you do any boxing? Oh, no. No, I'm not a boxer. I went to the cookout. Probably did that and went right back on duty. I did a lot of jogging. Did a lot of steel beach time. Um, did you form any lasting friendships uh, while you were aboard New Jersey? 
Um, yes, about six years ago, I started going to um, reunions with some of the guys in my division. So every two years we get together. And uh, it started out with just a couple guys, and it's grown, and it's grown, and it's grown. Uh, last year, due to medical reasons, we had to uh, abandon going at the last minute. But my understanding is last year there was um, between 40 and 50 wives and, and crewmen that got together in Las Vegas. Uh, two, uh, two years before that, we were here. We were in Atlantic City, uh, 25, 30 of us. Even got one of our old division officers, uh, Chief Warrant Officer Thomas, who we, uh, we all respected tremendously. So uh, seeing him again was, was amazing. But uh, next year we have another reunion. Where's that one going to be? That's going to be in Las Vegas. So I expect we're going to we're going to surpass man, 50. Duty man with the duty arms outside uh, the duty a lot of us, you know, there's clubs. there's a few of us that went to Beirut together. There's not many of us. The guys that came afterwards, you know, we we all became great friends. And I and now I'm getting the opportunity to meet people that I never knew. They came on board after I left, but we all shared the same thing. We were all New Jersey sailors. We were all operations specialists. So we have a bond. Looking back, what did uh, your time in the Navy and aboard the New Jersey do for you? How did it impact your life? Uh, I became a man. You know, I was 18 years old. I had never really been away from home. Now, here I was an operations specialist. I was serving aboard a ship that... Uh, just was, it, it was a, an awesome vessel. It commanded respect. You were part of this fantastic crew. Uh, I was learning a profession from people that had such great skill as operations specialists. And I, I was afforded the opportunity to just move forward and do things that in a civilian world you'd, you'd probably never be able to do. I, I went from a a kid from a one square mile town, I join the Navy, I pick a job field that I think is interesting, working with radar and communications, I end up, I, I go to schools, I learn to be a, a watch center supervisor, I end up being trained on the Tomahawk missile system, uh, I end up being an air intercept controller, working with aircraft, Anything I wanted to do, I had the opportunity, and I had the desire, and they allowed me to move forward. And to anybody that, whether they're civilian or military, if you have the desire and you have the motivation to do something, there's no reason why you can't do it. What did you do after you got out of the Navy? I was very fortunate. I got out of the Navy. My game plan was, my, my dad got out and he, he worked for a public utility. So my thought process was, well, you know what? This worked out so far following in my dad's footsteps. I want to work for a public utility. And uh, within three months of me getting out, I got a job at New Jersey Natural Gas. And uh, I've been there 30 years now. I work in a job that I like very much. I work with people that I work with that I like very much. I found that camaraderie, that similarity to service. Not not on the same level, but I found camaraderie. So that filled that void. You know, when you when you leave the service, you leave that camaraderie, and I was able to walk step right back into it. So I'm very happy that where I work and with, you know, what I do. And you're still working now? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going on 53. I still work. Mm -hmm. um, I look forward to retiring. You know, maybe when I retire, I can become a volunteer here. Right now, I'm, I, I do work a lot at times.
but I, I enjoy what I do. I like working outside. You know, you, you work for a job where you're paid to help people. You know, we Superstorm Sandy hit in 2012. We worked an awful lot. We had, there was a lot of devastation. And we were paid to help people. I get that's an amazing opportunity. And when you get ready to volunteer, contact us because uh, we could use help. Well, I, you know what? I, I'm at that point now, but I'm treading lightly because I, I have a busy schedule and I don't want to let anybody down because I do get called to work. But uh, we're at the point now where this is the first step. The next step is I, I have a lot of memorabilia that I have to look through and see what I can possibly let go of. And, you know, whether I donate it or make copies, I do have things that I want to see come here. And I, I want to be called. I, I want to come down when they want someone to talk to. When, even a, as a guest tour guide, I'm willing to do anything. And I think you'd find that with other former crew members, because we're all glad to come back. Yeah, we have quite a few. Well, Dave, it's been fun talking with you today, and you had some good stories to tell us. On the New Jersey, attention all self got against. As a reminder, remain on the red tour line at all times for your safety. I say again, attention all self We thank you for your against. service. Remain on the red tour line at all times for your safety. And thank you for your service, and thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with us today. We appreciate that. Oh, you're very, you're very welcome. You, you allowed me the opportunity to to talk a little bit and uh, I appreciate that and if you find some stuff uh, the Library of Congress we will send them a copy of this interview uh, they're interested in documents too or photos or whatever you might have so anything that you can make copies of we, if you send it to us we'll take care of making sure it, it gets uh, uh, indexed in the, your file uh, along with your this recording I will Okay, thanks again, Dave. We appreciate it. I have to sign off. I have to tag the end of the recording here by saying this is Ron Gutardi, volunteer director of the Oral History Program on the Battleship New Jersey. Today is June the 24th, 2017, and we've been uh, talking today with Dave Goodwin, who served on the New Jersey in the 1980s. Thanks again, Dave.